This is Conway's Game of Life. You may already be familiar with it, because it's the world's most famous cellular automata, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. But today, I'm going to go past Conway's Game of Life and simulate evolution to discover brand new, never-before-seen species of this kind of game. Now, what are cellular automata? Well, basically, they're simple computer models that live on a grid, and each square on this grid can be in one of two states, alive or dead and they live or die based on the number of living neighbors that they have. Take Conway's Game of Life, for example. Developed by the mathematician John Conway in 1970, the game has the following simple rules. Any living cell with less than two living neighbors dies because there aren't enough neighbors to reproduce with. Any living cell with more than three neighbors dies because of overpopulation. Any living cell with exactly two or three neighbors survives, and any dead cell with exactly three neighbors becomes alive due to reproduction. It's that simple. But from this very simple set of rules emerge a huge variety of very complex behaviors. In fact, Conway's game of life is proven to be Turing complete, meaning you can simulate any computer program inside of the game. It's been studied extensively over the years with people coming up with all sorts of crazy patterns and named organisms like gliders, puffers, and spaceships. They're one of the great examples of those things in math and computer science where very simple dynamics repeated at scale yield super complex behaviors. And so for a while I've been thinking, is it possible to go beyond Conway's game of life? Is it possible to discover new patterns and new games of life in a way that isn't so arbitrary and so hand-coded? In a way where the game itself writes the rules? What kinds of new patterns could we discover and what kinds of new behaviors can we unlock? But to do that, first we have to understand what it would even mean to discover a new game. A cellular automata basically consists of two things, a way of counting the neighbors of a cell and a set of rules for determining what lives and dies. In Conway's Game of Life, each cell sees its eight neighbors, including diagonals. And each of these neighbors counts for one in terms of determining whether the cell lives or dies. But we could easily imagine a scenario where a cell only sees its four direct neighbors and not diagonals. This would be the same as seeing all eight neighbors where the diagonals count for zero and the four direct neighbors count for one. We could imagine a scenario where only the left side neighbors count for one and everything else counts for zero, or where the left side neighbors count for two and the right side neighbors count for one. And each of these would yield completely different behaviors. We can encapsulate all of these behaviors in a set of eight numbers. In computer science and AI, we refer to numbers that control the behavior of a computer model as parameters. So our parameters right now are these eight numbers, which I will allow to be negative one, zero, or one. So for each neighbor, a cell can either completely ignore it, count it negatively towards its total neighbor count, or count it positively towards its neighbor count. The other thing that defines a cellular automata is the rule set for what lives and dies. And looking at Conway's Game of Life, we can see that these boil down to essentially three rules. A life-to-life -life rule, which determines when living cells survive, a life-to-death rule, which controls when living cells die, and a death-to-life rule, which controls when dead cells become alive. Each rule is governed by a number, a threshold beyond which the cell survives, lives, or dies. In this case, for this rule, two, and for this rule, three. For our purposes, we can make each of these threshold numbers a parameter, and there are five of them. For a living cell, if the neighbor count multiplied by those eight parameters we defined earlier, of course, is between these two numbers, the cell survives. If it's outside of the range of these two numbers, the cell dies. And for a dead cell, if the neighbor count is equal to this number, the cell becomes alive. So we can now define a cellular automata, or a game of life, based on these eight plus five equals 13 parameters. Now, the game of life is really just a name. It's not really life, and these are not really cells. But since at a high level it is inspired by living systems, I thought it made sense to learn these cellular automata using another method inspired by life, genetic algorithms. The way genetic algorithms work is somewhat like natural selection. You start with a random population of cellular automata. 
each one represented by a different random set of 13 parameters. Then we simulate each cellular automata, meaning we let it play out for some small number of time steps, and then we score each member of our population according to some fitness function. Then, based on their fitness scores, each member of the population has some probability of reproducing into the next generation. And the probability is proportional to the fitness score. So if you have two different cellular automata, and the first one gets a fitness score of 10, and the other one gets a fitness score of 1, the first one has a much higher probability of surviving into the next generation. Over many generations, just like in nature, the idea is that advantageous random traits will get selected out of the population, and the whole population will slowly converge toward that trait. And also, just like in nature, with every new generation, each member of the population has some small chance of getting a random mutation, meaning that some number of its parameters can get replaced with random numbers. Mutation helps encourage diversity, creating new random traits that might get selected and be advantageous, so that we don't just get stuck seeing the same traits over and over again. With all of that said, let's finally make this thing. I end up using a population of a thousand cellular automata. Each one runs for 20 steps before getting scored. At the beginning of the evolution, we want to discover a lot of new behaviors, so there's an 85% chance of mutation. But that decreases over generations, because we want to slowly zero in on the good mutations over time. We run this whole thing for a thousand generations. Now the most important thing about this entire system is the fitness scoring function. And I've experimented with a bunch of different variations. Here's what happens with a really simple score function, just the number of living cells. So each cellular automata is encouraged to grow as much as possible. In the first generation, we see, as we expect, just a bunch of random behavior. In the 10th generation, we also see pretty random behavior, and what's good here is that we see a lot of diversity in the kinds of strategies these cellular automata are picking. As we go on, we see what we expect, which is that population members that tend to have a lot of growth are becoming more dominant. And as we progress through the generations, we see what makes sense, which is that we start to zero in on a similar solution across the board. All of these cellular automata start to look the same because the most dominant trait is being selected for. Now let's try a more complicated score function. This score function is convolved entropy which basically means dividing this grid up into patches and then for each patch measuring the entropy and adding it up. Entropy, if you're not familiar with that, is basically a measure of randomness. So this measures how random the patterns are in each patch. The idea being that living systems are highly complex if you zoom in enough while appearing ordered on the surface at the high level. Just like before, in the first generation we see a lot of random behavior. And, in the first few generations, we keep seeing that sort of diversity. As the generations pass, we're starting to see these patterns get selected out, that have a lot of complexity and a lot of refinement, but also a sense of structure, a sense of order. And as we get to the end of training, we see that the cellular automata all start to look kind of the same, as they converge toward one dominant set of traits. And if we look at the average fitness score of our population over time, we can see that from a numerical perspective, it is learning pretty well. It starts out really low, and then it begins to climb quickly in the beginning as it makes easy, low-hanging fruit improvements. Then we begin to converge to a solution, so we see it taper off, and it continues to climb, making these incremental little improvements, which is exactly what we want to see. Now, this is just sort of a update or a log on this project, because there's still a lot I want to try. I want to try different selection mechanisms, different mutation mechanisms, I want to try different score functions. I've even written some code for a neural network implementation of this with a stochastic gradient descent based optimization instead of a genetic algorithm, which should allow us to more reliably learn more complex score functions. Now, if you want to play with this and try out a score function of your own, I've made all of my code open source, and you can find it in the GitHub repo linked in the description below. The actual simulation and fitness scoring uses batch 2D convolution via PyTorch, so it's pretty fast, but the actual genetic algorithm and the rest of the code is fairly unoptimized, so feel free to add whatever you want. I'll leave you with some strange and interesting patterns that I discovered through doing this project. And as always, thanks for watching, please subscribe, and I'll see you next week.